Hello, my name is David Ades. I'm a poet based in Sydney and the host of a monthly poetry podcast reading series called Poets Corner in association with Westwards in Parramatta in Sydney's West. Westwards is Western Sydney's literature development organisation. Poets Corner is part of Westwards public programming that celebrates the richness, diversity and insight that literature offers. Especially in these times, we thank the ongoing support of Create New South Wales, the Cultural Fund of Copyright Australia, City of Parramatta Council, Blacktown City Council and Campbelltown City Council, as well as the many project partners that have enabled us to continue to provide opportunities to writers and audiences. We hope that this new world will see a sharing and a closeness of spirit. As many of you would know, each month I invite a poet to read poems and talk about them for an hour or so around a theme of the poet's choice. Our guest poet today is Heather Taylor Johnson, who will read poems and talk on the theme of writing to and from historical figures, six literary heroines, and one modern day tyrant. But first, an acknowledgement of country. I'm recording this from Beecroft in Sydney. Heather is recording from near Port Adelaide in South Australia. I would like to pay my respects to and acknowledge the elders past, present and emerging of the Wellamita people, the traditional custodians of the land in Beecroft, and of the Ghana people, the traditional custodians of the land in the Adelaide Plains, and to acknowledge also that they are the sovereign owners of their land, which has never been ceded or given up. Heather Taylor Johnson is a multi-form writer living and working on Ghana land near Port Adelaide. Her most recent poetry books are the verse novel Rhymes with Hyenas and the collection Alternative Hollywood Ending, an anthology she edited, Shaping the Fractured Self, Poetry of Chronic Illness and Pain, was the winner of the Mascara Avant Garde Award and is read in disability circles around the world. Her second novel, Jean Harley Was Here, was shortlisted for the Readings Prize for New Fiction and optioned for a seven-part TV series. And she's this year's winner of Ireland's Nonfiction Prize for an essay on art and illness and where the two come together. Recent shortlistings include the Red Room Poetry Fellowship and ABR's Calibre Prize. She's an arts critic and an adjunct research fellow at the J.M. Katsia Centre for Creative Practice at the University of Adelaide, which is the university where she received her PhD in creative writing in 2008. Hi, Heather, and welcome to Poets Corner. Hello, thank you. Uh, and thanks for letting me be, be here today because I love what Westwards do does. It's really cool. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of fun for us too. Um, now, you'll be reading today from your latest two collections, uh, Rhymes with Hyenas and Alternative Hollywood Ending, which which have come out in quick succession. Um, one of the things that I enjoy about doing the series is asking poets to come up with a theme and then seeing what they come up with. And sometimes I try to guess it and usually I'm way off the mark. Um, by reference to your theme, writing to and from historical figures, Six Literary Heroines and One Modern Day Tyrant. Can you please introduce us to these two books and tell us a bit about the ideas underpinning <laughs> them and how you came to write them? Yeah. So um, they did come out in quick succession, I suppose. They both came out in, you know, October of, of the 2021 um, and 2022. And, and there's a reason for that. It's because um, Rhymes with Hyenas, it's just a weird timing thing. Um, Rhymes with Hyenas was a book I started in 2004 <laughs> and um, and just kept thinking it was it was too strange. I didn't know how to contain it. So I kept putting it away and then picking it up and putting it away and picking it up. And then, um, you know, the, the other book was begun sort of in 2016, I suppose. Well, yeah, when um, when Trump was elected. Um, and so they just happened to find find publishers around the same time, but they certainly were, were begun at different times. Um, so Rhymes with Hyena is the reason I thought it was so strange and nobody would ever want it is because it's about um, six female literary heroines who uh, were written by men. And uh, I've brought them together in Adelaide um, even though they, you know, span from Lilith of Hebrew mythology all the way to uh, Melanie Isaacs from Coetzee's Disgrace, um, and they they meet they come together in Adelaide and they join a they join a, a poetry group and um, it's 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 their poems but um, it's also their communication through email that creates the story 
of these women that you know lifts themselves from their original pages and gives them real um problems that um females have that aren't just about whether they you know they can they can open their legs for the men and <laughs> that sort of thing so um yeah so they deal with things like caring for um their children they deal with illnesses they deal with caring for um partners they deal with um uh work work problems um over being overworked in academia <laughs> they, um yeah they have um uh there's some abuse um physical abuse um yeah trauma um yeah so so they have their own stories, their own backgrounds. And then, um, yeah, the other one, Alternative Hollywood en Endings, uh, I, I sort of started writing that for a, um, my parents were visiting from America and we all thought Hillary Clinton was gonna <laughs> be our, <laughs> our first female president as so many other people did. And uh, when they come, they come for like six weeks. Uh, it's a long time. It's really intensive. And so I try to just, you know, get to a stopping point and don't do any work when they're here. And I was in the middle of writing a novel. And when they left, I just couldn't wait to get back to that novel. I was so excited. And then um, Trump was elected the day they left Adelaide uh, that that night. And um, I, I just couldn't get back to the novel at all. I just was kind of scrolling and crying and for days and just so angry and upset. And um, and I just thought I needed probably to write some poetry because that's kind of a balancing place for me. It's a bit cliched, but poetry really does. It's a place I go to when I, I need it. <laughs> um, so I just started, you know, um, looking up all these really horrible quotes of his that he'd used for his campaign that were just, you know, ridiculous. And um, I thought, well, I'll write poems to those quotes. And that will give me a little bit of control over how those things he was saying w w were making me feel. So, um, you know, I've taken, I've taken almost all the quotes out because the book came out so much, you know, later. And I didn't feel like we needed to give Trump any more space than we already have. But um, it, it was quite sad how sort of prescient the poems still were without his quotes there mm -hmm. um because the world has changed so much now you know and he was a big catalyst i think he was a huge catalyst for that and it's not over yet but anyway I'm no i know <laughs> no um, uh the back cover blurb of rhymes with hyenas so i just wanted to um a little, little bit of a quote here from um from it um in a vibrant commentary on literary patriarchy and the patriarchy beyond, this book considers the place of writing, critiquing, reading, performing and publishing poetry in a woman's space. I wondered, you, if, wondered if you could elaborate on that idea. Yeah, look, I had, I just had so much fun writing the emails. I mean, I was kind of in a happy place when I was doing the, the email correspondences because I love I love narrative so much. It's why I like to write novels. And uh, as the women were were um, sharing their poems, um, you know, they got to talk about the poetry scene in Australia, and I got to talk a lot about female poets. So there's a lot of people I mentioned in in the book that uh, we we would all know um, living in Australia. Um, you know, people like. Uh, Michelle Call, uh, Libby Hart, um, uh, there's Natalie Harkin, um, you know, it, just a few, a few, a few goodies scattered here and there. But they also, you know, they they lend each other literary journals. They go to book launches together. They um, so you know they get to talk about all the free wine at the book launch they went to, and they get to talk about um, um, you know. Uh, Fiona Wright popping up in in all of the the, the journals around, and they get to talk about um, uh, mascara and you know rabbit and um, yeah. So it's it was it, it oh it's spoken word scenes in Adelaide, which were especially fun. So I got to mention a few you know venues that used to hold spoken word um, events, and uh, so I really got to dive into into yeah what it means to 
to be in the poetry world in, in Australia. Um, but I did, I did, I, I did make a concerted effort not to have men, male poets discussed in it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the, I mean, it's fitting. Um, I was really intrigued about your, your literary heroines. Did they have to audition to you from a much larger cast of literary oh. heroines or do they jump out at you and demand to be in the book? Uh, um, Lilith is a latecomer and she kind of replaced, she replaced Medea. Okay. <laughs> um, I just felt like Medea's trauma was, I mean, her, her backstory was just way too much for me to in any way incorporate in, into any dialogue she was having anywhere in the book. So um, I had to, I had to change her with somebody that I could understand a little bit more. And I was very, very upset to get rid of an Ellen Jamesian, who is a um, would be a woman from yeah, um, the world according to Garp, which is one of my favorite books. Um, but you know, in that in that book, the Ellen Jamesians are just Ellen Jamesians. They don't have their own. They don't have their own um, names. They don't have their own backstories. They're just this group. This, these group of women. But the women cut their tongues out in retaliation of a a young girl named Ellen James who was raped and had, and the men cut her tongue out. And again, I just thought like, that is just um, a trauma. You know, these women would have probably had their own traumas in order to, 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 to be that um, in that sort of solidarity with this, this young girl. And I just thought, again, it was just something I couldn't really, you know, um, I, I just couldn't really go there and understand. And I really liked her. She was kind of a mothering figure to all the women. Um, so it was sad to get rid of her, but it had to be done. <laughs> the other ones were, um, yes, yeah, aside from um, Lilith, were all there from the start. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually just began with Caddy and Ursula. I'm oh, sorry, Ursula and Gudrun from um, Lawrence's Women in Love. Mm. I was going to go to a D.H. Lawrence conference. I did go to it and I wanted to present something creative. So I thought I'll have those, you know, I'll have them send poetry to each other. And then it just um, it just expanded and Goodwin left. But I, she makes a guest appearance. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, so I mean, the, the, the next question, which is which is a related question, is how steeped did you have to be? in the characters of these six uh, heroines when you undertook mm. the project? And how much did you have to go back to them to draw inspiration for the personas you developed for them? Yeah, that, I mean, that's a really interesting question because, you know, I come from an academic background, so one would think I would have done a lot of research, but um, I, I really decided that I, I just wanted to read the texts and I didn't want to go beyond the texts. Um, and, in hindsight, you know, I sort of think, oh, it could have added a lot of richness to it if I had done the research. But um, I just felt like I just wanted kind of that um, that gut instinct that a reader would get, especially a female reader reading a, a man's book who had written women. I thought it would be best to just stick with what I how I felt about their stories mm. and the way they weren't being portray portrayed. So I kind of thought if I did some research, I might um, I might learn too much. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, so what process did you go through to give each of these uh, figures a contemporary voice? Um, did you feel that like you had a lot of imaginative freedom to explore and articulate those voices or did you find that there were constraints? Uh, um, I suppose, I, well, I treated each one I tried to treat each one really differently in terms of their <laughs> their punctuation and their emails and the the rhythms of their you know um, their emails, likewise in their poems as well. Um, so I worked with form a lot in their poems. So you know Katharina from Taming of the Shrew, who you know is all is called Kate throughout that play. She she is um, she's abused by Petruchio still. Um, she's still living with him mm. and deals with his abuse. And so she's she's probably the most traumatized. And so she writes in these little sort of jagged poems where the words are all over the place. And sometimes the meaning gets cut off. Um, and so, yeah, that kind of form for her worked. And 
<clears throat> for Caddy, I just wanted her to really be um, right in the thick of of having little kids. And so she talks a lot about about the incessancy of <laughs> of a child hanging from her. And I have to bring him to. Well, I'm going to have to bring Bruno to the to the meeting today. I hope nobody minds. And um, and also, uh, you know, I used a lot of my old poems. Um, you would remember the KPT, maybe. <laughs> I remember KPT. Very fondly. I love KPT. <laughs> so there's a lot of KPT poems in here. That's just a little poetry group I was in, you know, in 2000 and, um, well, 2000 it was with uh, Stan Sim, who, who went by Shen and Belle Shank and Tim Sinclair, Kim Mann, Lucy Alexander. Uh, there's a lot of KPT poems in there. And so, I was able to, you know, grab my some of my old ones for Caddy when I was having babies, and then I was able to grab some old ones uh, from Dolores, who's a spoken word artist. And when I was with the KPT, we were writing kind of a lot of performative, you know, drug, sex, and rock and roll type poems, and so that really fit with Dolores. And so it was just a matter of with those old poems, it was great because I just I got to reshape them and edit them to fit the voices I was working with. Mm. Um, so yeah, lots of form, lots of punctuation, uh, rhythm and flow, that sort of thing. Um, um yeah. <laughs> um, so the book, the book starts with the bio notes of the uh, seven literary women, the, the six that are part of the book and, and Goodrun. Um, and for me, that, that is a perfect introduction to the book because readers immediately get a sense of fun and play in the, in the contemporary biographies you've given them. Um, the way that they are situated in Adelaide, the name dropping that you already mentioned of Australian journals, publishers, poetry competitions, prizes, poets, and by the references to rhymes with hyenas itself. Uh, was was a lot of fun to write these biographies? Uh, you know, they came really quickly. <laughs> um, it was it was really fun coming up with the idea. Like the idea was uh, a trip, right? Because I, I was I was well aware I had to have a biography for each woman in there because not everybody's going to have read every book um and so yeah when I went oh actually this is these are modern day women I have to give them modern day um bios um it, it became really fun and then you know I suppose it solidified a few a few of their um characteristics as well for me mm. uh that helped so you know when I'm when I was talking about Dolores, who you would know is Lolita, uh, when I was talking about Dolores Hayes and she'd, she'd won, you know, she'd won a grant to go to America and perform some spoken word. And she brought her daughter with her. Um, that whole bringing her daughter with her thing was kind of a new thing to me when I wrote the bio. And so then I added her teenage daughter in there throughout a, a little bit. And I think that gave Dolores a whole new sort of personality and a whole new um, purpose within the group as well so yeah so yeah I, I, I quite liked discovering that a bio can do a lot <laughs> for yeah, a person yeah. well, I was intrigued to hear you say that they came quickly because um, I've always found a question with bio notes is what to put in and what to leave out and um, and that bio notes can have a lot of iterations before you settle on a final one did do these have a lot of iterations before you got were you satisfied with them? No. Yeah, they came really quickly. Yeah, I was. I I was like thinking I was so clever as I was doing it. You know? <laughs> so I think I had a lot of confidence sitting down to do it because I liked the idea. So they they, they did come really quickly. Yeah. yeah. Mo but the thing I added the most were probably the emails. Um. The that that was that was just you know over the years that was just over the years constantly over over almost twenty years of editing those emails. <laughs> <laughs> we, will, we will come to that, Heather. Um, you, were, you were going to start with one of the one of the bio notes. Uh, yeah. So, I think I'll read um, Caddies. So, okay, yes. Yeah, so, oh, I'll just say so. The women are Ursula and Goodwin Bragwin. Um, but like I said, Goodwin is not in rhymes with hyenas. Um, she she's just has a little a little a little um showing at one point and then caddy from the sound of the fury dolores from lolita mel isaacs from disgrace lilith from hebrew mythology and katharina from taming of the shrew 
So Caddy Compson was once the focus of William Faulkner's The Sound and the Fury, though her narrative was not told by her. The three male narrators, her brother Benji, Quentin, and Jason, were so moved by her sexuality that it was a point of mania, ultimately leading to castration, suicide, and lifelong bitterness. She is an exile from Jefferson, Mississippi, where her family and her daughter live. Caddy now lives in Adelaide with her partner and their two young boys, who inspire many of her poems. Her first Australian publication was in Rabbit. Well, Rabbit's a good place to start, isn't it? Oh, my gosh. I would love my first publication, too. <laughs> <I am. laughs> um, now, you're home in, in this biography, you're home in on the fact that her narrative in Faulkner's The Sound of the Fury was not told by her. Um, I'm really interested uh, in this male appropriation of female narratives uh, that is sort of at the centre of this book. Um, is that something that jumps out to you when you read those narratives? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the person who probably does the female backstories the best would be Lawrence. And it's interesting because he gets the women so wrong. Like he gives them, he gives them a lot of dialogue and he gives them, he, he gives, you know, the sisters are together alone a lot. So they're, they're sisterly and womanly, womanly, but he gets them so wrong, you know, um, the way I think the way they desire and the way they, um, yeah, they're just, they're just, well, they're just big sex symbols really. Um, and so in saying that he's the closest to them, you know, getting them right is, is scary. Um, but like Coetzee, you know, with Mel Isaacs, she is kind of the whole reason the book takes off. You know, she's the student that he um, he coerces into having sex with him um, as a as a professor, and she really doesn't she doesn't get she doesn't get anything. She doesn't get any backstory at all, and she's a really interesting woman because um, she did stand up for herself. She took you know she she told somebody at at school what had happened, and she bookends the book, but. We don't we don't get to hear from her, um, so yeah, it, it's 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 frustrating. I mean, I, I get that I get that some characters are tropes in books. I get that, but when when the character is so pivotal, like Mel Isaacs or Caddy, especially you know, because the entire book is about her, <laughs> and it's just told in three different parts by men, um, it, you really do feel like. I mean, I think a lot of writers do take minor characters out and give them give them real stories. I, I haven't done anything new here, but um, I guess the the amount of women I've chosen maybe is a little is a little bit new in bringing them together. Um, but yeah, it's it 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 felt great to give them some story, and mm -hmm. and you know some of their story is their original story, of course. Um, that's I haven't denied that they've all been through the the traumas. Um, and in fact, you know, Ursula quotes from D.H. Lawrence a yes. lot, and yes. some of the girls have a problem with that. And um, she is kind of grateful to Lawrence um, in many ways. And the other ones don't really want to talk about their authors. They don't talk about their authors. <laughs> She's the only one who does. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think that this is like, touching on what could be a huge conversation that, you know, we, we don't have time for here, but there's any number of questions that um, crop up. Um, I mean, at the end of the book, you do acknowledge the, the, the men who wrote the book, the books that you're you know, taking these characters from. Um, but I was wondering whether or not, you know, it detracts from the narrative for you when, when, um, and this happens um, clearly. It's sort of something that frustrates and irritates. Irritates. Um, no, you know, I've chosen these books because I love them, and mm. there's there's some there's some of my. I mean, I think Disgrace is is the most perfect book ever written. You know that and uh, uh, two others. <laughs> but, you know, there's there's. I just love it, Sound of the Fury. I, it's just you know I, I I've read it three times and it's a dense book <laughs> I, I love these books and 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 um and and I wouldn't have chosen a book by that I didn't like um yeah. just just to to make a point um I, I had to choose books that I that I, I wanted to I wanted to honor in a way mm. so um so it doesn't frustrate me that 
the women didn't get their backstories. I guess what frustrates me is that there are there were there are just a history of so many stories written by men, <laughs> and so um, it was kind of a it was kind of a a, a way to show that. Um, Oh gosh, I don't know how to say it. Um, I guess it was really fighting against the patriarchy more than fighting against the authors. Mm -hmm. um, I, I don't think the you know could Coetzee have added in Mel's um, backstory. Well, he could have, but his his real story was between his, his main character and his daughter. Um, Mel was Mel was a catalyst to get get him to live with his daughter. Um, so. Yeah, he could have, but it it would have been a, a bit of a different story. So yeah, so I guess it's it's more about you know me growing up with all these books written by men, and mm -hmm. and me as a, a girl wondering what those women were really like. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fascinating because as a man, I didn't pick up on it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's something for me to learn here. Um, but I'll, I'm wondering if it's partly a a function of the fact that historically most books published were written by men. So there wasn't the opportunity for women to write women's narratives. You know, I just finished reading uh, Orlando for my book club and mm. it's just, she's so funny, Virginia Woolf, but she's got this, this bit in there where she's, she's in, in one of her stages of life, she's meeting these famous male poets and, they're all geniuses and, you know, and, and she's just, she can, she can only name the males because there were, they were, <laughs> there were no women around her. And mm. I think that's just, you know, I, it, it was, it was quite funny, but it was really heartbreaking to, to read that and to know that there were so many women writing, you know, and um, they just, they just couldn't break in. And um, gosh, I think, you know, I think since the Stella prize started, we, we've just done, such amazing uh, made such amazing leaps and bounds toward um toward really showcasing women and being excited about women writers i think the stella has a lot to has a lot to pat themselves on the back for that one i think it's a global phenomenon now i don't think it's just just us um mm. so many wonderful women writers around but uh, yeah um and then uh, sort of the converse question is you know have you come across women writers who um appropriate male narratives uh, <laughs> well, I mean, that's of, really why, interesting. Why <laughs> well, it's interesting, like, because I think that a lot of women writers do work with relationships. Um, so, I mean, I think Jonathan Franzen is a, is an interesting male writer who, who writes women really, really like, I like the way he writes women, but he writes about relationships um, as well. And I think women write, write really they write a lot about relationships and so there have to be men there but it it um yeah look i i can't i can't think i can think of like the writers that i really love to read i love to read siri husband and she does males a lot um she always has interesting women surrounding those males and those interesting women always seem to have backstories mm. um I think she does a good job with males, but I don't know. I I, I don't know what it's like to think and live like a male. So <laughs> All right. I, I have, I have written male, you know, males in uh, my novels. And um, it's a funny thing because I, I didn't change them too much from the female, the way I wrote the females. Yeah. So I, I don't know if um. I don't know what it's like to write as a male either, right? Like, <laughs> well, I'm just going to read my books differently from now on, I think. Um, <laughs> can we do a poem? Yes. Um, I've picked out a poem by Ursula. So Ursula is the only poet who, who, will, who will quote from her original work. And I guess that's how the book started, you know, when I wanted to go to that conference. So this is called Afterlife. Dear, dear winter, what is to say heaven is not in the sea? I walked, my feet wet in a maddening headwind. There was a dog trying to round me up. The seaweed piled in islands before me, 
intermittent sprays of sun and the noise of the wind and riotous waves and the wet suited kite surfer splashing the sky. God knows to die means only to move on with the invisible. Imagine diving, though stronger than diving, a perfect acceptance of water, a perfect forgiveness of earth's falling away. Among fish, I could be eternal. Well, it's been years since I walked on one, but that sounds a lot like an Adelaide beach to me. She lives in Munta. There you go. <laughs> Not quite but, Adelaide. But, but I was, I reckon I was in semaphore when I was. Yeah. <laughs> now, I, I'm, I'm intrigued by this poem. What is Ursula, what's she wrestling with here? Because, because yeah. as a literary heroine, she has long outlived D.H. Lawrence. I mean, she may already be eternal. Um, <laughs> so why does she need to be among fish? And what is life and death to a literary persona? Well, um, you know, with I, it's so much more, it's so much less existential than that, really. <laughs> <laughs> um, for her, she's caring for Rupert, her lover from Women in Love. And he, you know, he's always sick in the book. He's just endlessly sick. And so he's still sick. And, um, you know, there, there's a sense that he's, that he's dying. And so um, there's also, she, she also, she wants to be pregnant by him before he dies. Um, and they, together they live by the ocean. So, you know, it's a, it's a good place to contemplate birth and death um, by the water. And um, mm. I think, I think fish for her have taken on this new meaning. Um, they sort of sort of symbolize the birth part of it. They sort of symbolize the um, the babies that she would like to have. And um, so, yeah, so I think her poems are always wrapped up. They always seem to be wrapped up in the ocean, in Rupert, in love and with um, longing. All of the women have a lot of longing, um, some for home, like, you know, the homesickness. Um, she really has a longing for this uh to keep things together i suppose to keep things moving forward and it's not really happening so mm -hmm. she's she's struggling a bit and she's the one who brings them all together because she thinks she needs women in her life to get help her get through this part of her life mm. um I, i'm curious about the, your process in writing poems for each of these um literary heroines and you said you've sort of pluck the poems from all over the place over the years but when you sat down to write this poem for example mm. uh did you try and channel your version of ursula ursula's persona first and and then write it or did you try to get into ursula's head or did you write the poems first and then try to fit them with a particular character <laughs> uh i had i had the idea of who they were what kind of person they were before i wrote the poems mm. so i mean this one i wrote straight for Ursula I didn't this one didn't come from an old poem mm. so the ones that came from the old poem I I edited to what I had thought the women were going to be like um but the Ursula ones all came fresh mm. and um she's just extremely passionate you know and um so I her poetry I like her poems because I feel like they're um quite rich in emotion um they're dramatic <laughs> Um, because I think she's super dramatic in the book, <laughs> in her book, you know, so, um, or in women, Lawrence's book. So, yeah, so I, I sort of kept her, I kept her um, just um, the woe is me bit about her. And, but, but she's also a very strong woman too. Um, yeah. So how did you, how do you differentiate each of their voices from Heather Taylor Johnson's voice? Well, I probably haven't. Um, They're all your voice too, aren't they? <laughs> yeah, um, I probably haven't. Um, I think, you know, I, I think they're all different styles. Um, if I look through there, you know, they're they're all they're all things that I could easily have written myself and taken their name away, and it would still probably look like a Heather poem. But um, I, like I said, lots of form, lots of form and rhythm. I tried to sort of compartmentalize them. So, you know, I, I would, I would work on one woman at a time. Mm. Um, and that way I could keep that style. Um, consistent. Yeah. Consistent. So, you know, they, they, are, they, <laughs> they're, they're all very much me and, and that was hard 
that was really hard in 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 editing it as a as a as a book not poem by poem but once i got to editing it as a book that was really hard to to make sure that they didn't all sound similar they didn't all sound like like me but again i i'm not i'm not sure i i did it but i tried really hard <laughs> i mean that is hard that is very hard um taking the i out of the the poetic i out of the poem um but it helps i suppose if you've got personalities to shape them around yeah i mean they're all do they all deal with stuff that i deal with right so yeah. some of them are are really really homesick and and uh, yeah and some of them you know deal with a, a newly diagnosed illness and um there, there are things that i've been through in my life um the trauma the physical abuse and and that sort of thing um i haven't but of course just living as a living as a woman you know there's um i i i get the mm -hmm. the um you know the shushing and the and the, the the pushing away and that sort of thing just um just from living as a woman but the, the trauma was always um theirs and and i suppose that was kind of the hardest to deal with and to draw forth from my own life so that was that bit was probably more not heather but pretty much everything else was was yeah something i could relate to mm. Now you mentioned that you know this book was a long time coming in and you kept putting it away and bring it out again anyway you could have written it i suppose simply as a selection of poems by six literary heroines what made you think to turn them into a poetry group and incorporate in the book email exchanges between them well it it did begin that way it did begin as just poetry and in fact when I sent it out to a publisher, they said, we'll publish it right now if you take the emails out. <laughs> I went, no, no. But um, it did begin as just poems. And then as soon as I, as soon as I added in, as soon as I thought about them corresponding, I liked it, right? So I didn't actually really like it when it was just poems. I thought it was an interesting idea, but again, you know, how can I contain this? And then as soon as I, I thought about bringing narrative into it, which, you know, like I, I, I really, I really love writing novels. So it was such a um it was such a good a good place for me to be as a writer to be able to give them all all stories. Mm -hmm. And I did try to give them stories in their poems. But you know, the, aside from just enjoying writing narrative myself and 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 making that like a super fun challenge, it also was it also was like this way to sort of praise uh female uh, poetry groups and when i started really getting into this i was in a group with um my two friends who i've dedicated the book to allison flett and rachel mead and we were just getting to know each other and we were just you know literally falling in love with each other as people but but also as poets mm. and it was almost idyllic and um and the book when I started adding emails became that it became this sort of idyllic sort of back and forth between them. And um, it became the sisterhood, which is exactly what happened with us. But then, you know, there's six women in this book. So I had to step back a little bit and realize that some personalities would clash and there's no way it was going to be as tight as a trio could be in that way. So, uh, so that was interesting as well, <laughs> putting in the, the, the small clashes here and there. Um, but you know, once I started adding the emails, it, it really became so much about sisterhood. And that makes a lot of sense to me in terms of what I'm trying to do with bringing them together in the first place. Yeah. 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 Well, let's, let's get a taste of some of these emails. <laughs> right. Um, okay. So this is a, this email starts with, um, it's it's from Caddy to Katharina, and Caddy has just read a poem that Katharina has written about Katharina's sister. And Caddy says, "Hey, Katharina, I promise you, I cried when I read your poem. I can see how much you miss your sister. I have such strong memories of my brother Benji, and I miss him every day. With his disability, it seemed no one in our family had the patience for him. But I loved him, and I cared for him. Do you think memory would exist without childhood?" and our concept of home too. Doesn't home need childhood? And can po poetry exist without memory and therefore home and therefore childhood? I've been getting 
a collection of poems together for the Adelaide Festival Wakefield Press Award for unpublished manuscripts and editing all the poems I've written since we moved here. And even though they're about my here and now, there's memory everywhere. Water, forests, landmarks I've claimed as my own, people I've loved, the path I took to school and the scent of the foliage. I've had so many homes in my adult life that I think I need to be rooted again. In the American sense, I mean, actually going through a sexual slump right now, but that's a whole other story. Is Adelaide a place I can set down roots? Sometimes I dream of Mississippi in my return. I'd take Jean Guy and the boys and make it our home and I'd feel, I'd feel pure. My daughter is there. I would hold her and tell her I'm sorry a million times and never let go. Then my older brother would kill me. This is not an exaggeration. Wishing I could hug you right now, Caddy. Katharina responds, I can't get into home right now. I'm tender from some difficult days and terrible nights, literally tender. Patricio is enjoying the cur current global swing towards normalized racism and we argue all the time. He is an ass and men will always kill women. Is winter almost over? X, Katharina. Um, Caddy, Caddy responds to her, but I, I'll just um, skip over that. And, um, and then I, and then I've got Caddy's poem here, um, which, you know, like didn't necessarily, it didn't necessarily come in the group at this time, um, but the poems that have come in the group, I, I, have, I have made so they flow from conversation to conversation. So Caddy's poem is called Mississippi. You offer me crab apples, lightning bugs, a red pickup with a Confederate flag passing black men walking for miles, the gentle roll of the flat road leading to some other country. I wrap the warmth of my body around your great rivers, my hips and elbows curving with each bend. I let clear water from creeks splash my skin, hold white pebbles in my hand and then pack them away for a time like now. I smell you, Mississippi, petals of honeysuckle wet like my own. Your name, a soft stammer on my tongue, like a lover's. I romanticize you as wild and random. Native honeybees flirt in the juices of a full blossom magnolia tree where, it, where in its branches, the trill of a mockingbird. And over there, the sound of someone's pleasure at three in the afternoon. Sarsaparilla, chigsaw, loblolly pine, dead skunk. I can hear your guitar and your fiddle, your children and your unborn babies, the old stories, of mammies, of the fields, of dead brothers. So the email exchanges between Katerina and Caddy um, sparked Caddy's sense of longing in this poem, Mississippi. Um, and and I, I, I see Heather in this too, because, you know, you're from the, the States and you've been living in Australia for 20 plus years, 23 for 24 years. Um, that sense of longing is part of your heritage too, I guess. Yeah. Um, do emails with friends spark poems for you? Um, no. <laughs> Short answer. <laughs> no. Um, you know, I guess like what I was saying when I interrupted them to say, you know, putting putting the poems um, there, like next to an email that would suit them. That was a that was an interesting decision because it, it took me a long time to work out how I was going to do that. Was I going to do it chronologically, um, or was I just going to let the reader accept that I'm picking poems from here and there and putting them in the right places to make the narrative work better? Um, so, yeah. Um, I, I like to think that their poems spark each other's poems um, mm. more than the emails. Yeah. Yeah. But I mean, the sparks, uh, we, as a writer, you'd know, I guess sparks can come from anywhere, can't they? Mm. Yeah. So were, there, were there other sparks of this book? What were the sparks of this book? Um, I, like, I just feel like it was almost all email <laughs> when I think about the inspiration sort of part of it you know I felt like the poems were really hard work mm. um but then the email was where I got to have so much fun and and so so much of their back and forth really did come from the feeling I got from my backing and forthing with Allison and Rachel when we were 
getting to know each other and and like I said just completely um absorbed by this <laughs> group we had called we called ourselves edit when sober and um uh, so I think I think that uh, the biggest spark would have been yeah real life interaction with other women mm -hmm. well one of the features of this book um is that both in their poems and in their email exchanges you make these figures contemporary how yeah. hard is that? <laughs> uh, how hard is that? A lot easier than not making them contemporary. Okay. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I don't know. Like, I wish I knew the answer to why I did that. It, because uh, I would like to say, you know, oh, probably it's because it was the easiest thing to do. But... <laughs> But, I, you know, it was so long ago that I started doing this. It was so many years ago. I really can't remember what my thinking was at the time. Um, I, 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 think, I think it was because I, I was a modern day woman trying to put um, these, these female concerns into these women. And so I wanted, it, 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 I only knew about modern day. And so I was probably trying to channel my own, like what I put my energies into in my living. I was probably trying to channel that into them. Um, but I think a lot of it would, would have to do with just a, just a, um, a fear of not being able to, to do historical type fiction, you know? Um, yeah, I, I, I don't, I don't read historical fiction. Um, I, I don't know that I would, I would be able to pull it off. So well, I mean it makes it makes sense if you're you know establishing a poetry group now. And that makes that makes sense to me and it makes sense that you give them contemporaneous voices. But I was just wondering how, you know, what pitfalls you had to try and cross um yeah. for example to try and make them sound authentic. Yes. I mean, I don't hide the fact that they are historical, you know, like um I say that that uh Lilith is grieving for her her, her wife Eve um, and that uh, you know they had lived a millennia together before Eve died so I don't I don't yeah I'm, I'm quite okay with them crossing geographical and temporal boundaries mm -hmm. to find each other yeah. um, look I just think I, and it was fun to play with those sorts of things like it was really fun to do with the intertextuality sort of sort of thing um, the more I did it, the more I sort of giggled to myself and went, this is, this is cool. This is working. And then of course, you know, two months later went, put that back in the drawer <laughs> until you worked it out a little bit more. <laughs> um, but yeah, um, look, David, I probably just really thought that it was the easiest way to do it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so you said that it was a lot harder to write the poems than the emails. Um, mm -hmm which I'm finding an interesting thing to say, given that, you know, you, you're, you're a poet and you've been a poet for many years. Why do you think that was? Um, I think I feel, okay. So I have this thing where I don't actually think I'm a, a really great poet <laughs> and because they're in this, they're in, in this group together um, and I had to make them all different. I felt like I really had to make, them all shine and then as, as soon as I as soon as I came to the idea that hang on this is actually a poetry group they're critiquing each other's poems these aren't polished poems they've given each other these are these are drafts mm. then I became okay with the poet with the poetry but that was that was years into this right that that was like that was only probably five years ago you know so what <laughs> it sounds like a long time ago but in the in the life of this book, that's way, you know, that's a, that's three quarters of the way into the life of this book. So as soon as I realized that they didn't have to be perfect poems, then I started kind of liking them and then I could play around with them a little bit more. But from the beginning, I think I just was, you know, um, like Lilith and Ursula were sort of more practice poets. So, you know, they've had publications. Um, whereas like, Delor or sorry, um, Mel and Katharina didn't. So Mel and Katharina, uh, from the beginning, I gave myself permission to not be great, but I really felt like, oh, I need to make Ursula and Lilith really, really good. Um, so that was kind of, you know, like one of them's won the Josephine Ulrich prize and 
<laughs> um, you created yeah, so, a rod from your own back there, did you? Yes. <laughs> so I just, you know, I, I think I was putting too much pressure on myself and and forgetting that I didn't win the I didn't win the Josephine Holbrook Prize. So, um, I, I can't I can't just like come up with brilliance. Um, so yeah, that's probably why they were hard. So it's kind of self imposed pressure, really, in a way. <laughs> um so there's all sorts of conversations going on between these women uh and you you use uh, a whole bunch of devices in the book shifts in tone points of connection support camaraderie humor little gripes irritations disagreements personal struggles mood changes to make it real um and, and it does come across i mean i like it i like all that sort of uh that sort of uh, changes of mood and little gripes and uh, the nuances. Do you feel that in writing these women, you came to know them better? Oh, yeah, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Um, I haven't reread any of the books since I've written written this. I mean, I, re- I reread them all to, to write it, and I reread them more than once during this, this very long process, but I haven't reread them since. Um, it, it would be such an interesting exercise, mm. wouldn't it? But, uh, yeah, look, I, like, I just really love, you know, I love, I love Dolores so much and, and she was from Lolita and, you know, she's kind of a, a really difficult character to really like in Lolita. It's all about Humpert Humpert, you know, it's, it's all about his story and she's kind of, I don't know, she's kind of this like kind of a brat really throughout but you know when you think about what's what's going on in her life it's really horrible but um i i she's an adult in my book you know and mm-hmm. she's a child and um i just i love her like she's somebody I, I would like to hang out with you know and she was not at all that kind of person in lolita so um yeah i definitely grew to love i really like i said really i really loved my ellen jamesian character and it was it was you know i I felt like i grieved her when i had to get rid of her so so i do i do like these characters a lot yeah well you know that leads into my next sort of comment thought question um you may or may not like me for this but i can imagine the dialogue between and the poems by these personas continuing is there a sequel in the works? Oh, <laughs> never even considered that. <laughs> Do you know what? When you were when you were forming that question, I thought you were going to say something about you could imagine the the females talking to their creators. <laughs> that was going. Oh, that would be interesting. <laughs> I mean, you've opened it. You've opened a a door here. Uh, yeah. You might want to walk through it again. I don't know. All right. Now, um, alternative Hollywood ending is a completely different. Yeah. Isn't it? Uh, so shall we have a read of a couple of things from here? Yes, sure. Um, yeah, so the first one I'm going to read, they're separated into sections, and um, one of them, I guess, is sort of like, you know, earth poems, um, eco poems. Um, and and I took the quote out, but it it initially, the quote initially came from, Trump saying the concept of global warming was created by and for the Chinese in order to make U.S. manufacturing non-competitive. <laughs> right. Okay. So it's called what we think of when we think of the earth. We were here before our bodies, tiny concepts shining through fissures, our future breaths humming in the cold air, the earliest form of electricity. We didn't see the breaking of the ice, but felt its horrendous blow why we fear death now. You say a truth of ice is that it melts. Why punish the blowtorch? You say we should pave our our way to heaven crossing the gates and petroleum stink because though the angels won't approve, they'll covet our chic black clothes. Money doesn't grow on trees, money is trees. And if you cut one down and ax through the belly, you say it'll birth a dollar bill. I say we'll miss green, what we think of when we think of the earth. So as you mentioned, there are a um, bunch of sections in this book. Uh, this is the first poem in the the title to the first section. Um, and um, Melinda Bufton notes on the back here, um, 
one of its themes is the uh, urgent, astonishing dangers of our present moment. Uh, this poem is a riposte, I suppose, to the rapaciousness that is ev evident everywhere, particularly in sort of Trump's world worldview. Um, but it is almost a lament, almost an elegy for the earth. Um, so this kind of, it's infused with a kind of sadness. Can you elaborate on what you were thinking when you wrote this poem? Um, yeah, look, like, like like I said, you know, the, there are there are twenty poems in this book that that all came from from quotes from him, and they really were ways for me to deal with 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 him <laughs> and what what he was doing to me <laughs> um you know when he got elected and when he came into presidency and um and you know of course <laughs> things like taking some of our um national parks away in in, in alaska to drill and you know um it, it was just, it all felt so inevitable. It all felt like that was always going to happen as soon as, as soon as he, he got in power. Um, and so, yeah, it, it, it is a lament for sure. Um, but I think, I think in, in writing that poem, you know, because his quote is so, it's, it's so, it's so ridiculous. It's got to be humorous, you know, to say that the Chinese created global warming for manufacturing, you know, to, to, to be an economic power. Um, as soon as I was able to sort of see that it was ridiculous and then that I could change that tone. And um, I, I guess it gave me a little bit of, um, it just gave me a little bit of power <laughs> mm -hmm. over him because he had a lot of power over me. Um, so yeah, um, so, some of the poems in the book I think are a little bit quirky and work with, you know, work with his ridiculousness. Um, but some of them um, are just too, you know, they just are too. They're too sad. <laughs> yeah. Mm. Now, one of the things that always interests me. Um... When when a poet chooses to read, in this case, three poems from a book, is uh, the poems that they choose. Um, what made you choose this one to read today? Well, I wanted to choose one poem from each section. I've just chosen a, a poem from three sections. But um, I think, you know, uh, why did I choose this one? Um, I think it's quite simple. Um it it doesn't it doesn't depend on any. I guess I guess some of the poems are a little bit kind of cleverish, um, and I don't think this poem is clever. I think it's very um, it's it's short. It's um, it's like something <laughs> it's like something Ursula might write. <laughs> it's got a bit of passion yeah, in it, it. Really, yeah. but I think it's quite simple and maybe um, missing the sea. But otherwise, yeah, and and I think that's why I wanted to open the book with it as well. Um, yeah, it's a, it leads in to the, the general discussion. Yeah, okay. Uh, you have another one for us? Yeah. Uh, so a useful body. So, you know, around the time this was happening with me and trying to cope with, with Trump, of course, Me Too movement, you know, just um, oh, just exploded. And, um, and I, yes, I ended up taking out a lot of his, his quotes about women because I didn't, they just didn't need him anymore. You know, it was just, yeah. everybody owned this problem now. <laughs> um, so this is called a useful body. One, I crawled from couch to kitchen when I stayed home sick from school, afraid a man might look inside and know I was alone. It was the 80s in America, kidnapping fashionable, and there was my young, pliable body, the milk cartons, a single shoe in the street I thought belonged to a missing girl. Two, at school, in an empty room, a boy pushed me to the ground, said, this is how you do it, humping his heft onto my body. His jeans rubbed against mine. I memorized the patterns in the ceiling. When I told the teacher who told my parents and the boy had to say he was sorry, he became my guardian for the rest of year five. I was so grateful because it meant that no one could mess with me anymore. Three, 
I'm still scared at night. Rarely ride my bike in the dark, even though it's three years since that man jumped in front of me, my bike light blinking all over my body while I cowered in the street. The tram stop, the evening cars cruising by. He said he was going to rip me in two. And I was so grateful that he didn't. Four. Once a man broke into my home and put his hand between my thighs then climbed out my bedroom window. Probably one of your friends, said the cops. The beer bottles from a party we'd had guilty as my thighs. Five. Such a useful body. Magnificent. But sex can be a problem. Once I was messing around with a man who, told, who I told to stop and he tried and tried and it was a challenge, but eventually he stopped. Why did you have to play with me like that? I should have asked him the exact same thing. Six. Last night, I was at a party celebrating the success of a group of friends, and I posed with my arms around two men. There's him, me, and cleavage, one said as we looked at the photo, but I don't remember the image on his phone. It's hard to know what I remember, but I remember telling a male friend about it hours later, drinks later, and he moved the collar of my dress to better see my cleavage. Seven. My daughter is a gymnast can climb a rope faster than her two older brothers using only her arms, legs straight out, pointed toes. She has such a magnificent, useful body. She'll be 10 in October. Well, thank you for this poem. Um, uh, I could invite you to sort of talk about it, but I, thought I just, uh, before you do, um, ask you a little bit. The accumulation of these incidents in this poem is is harrowing, um, particularly, I think, because of the matter of fact way uh, that you recount them, stripped of you know much of the emotion that would have gone with them. I imagine um, one way of writing this poem would have been to make outrage front and center, um, but you have chosen not to do that. What was your thinking in making that choice? Um, well. You know, it, it is all matter of fact. And um, unlike the women in, you know, Rhymes with Hyenas, um, I don't, I don't, I don't have their traumas, um, but in each of these little tiny vignettes, I sort of do. <laughs> yeah. um, so um, this is just part of being a woman. And I think that, in, in, you know, ending it with my daughter, um, first of all, like I, I would never want her to be in a poem that's really, really angry, <laughs> but um, in ending it with her, uh, it, it, the poem actually ended the Me Too movement in Australia anthology. It was the last poem. It was the last piece of writing in that book, which is mostly essays. And I was like, oh my gosh, my image of Matilda and the entire book this is so brilliant she's like this beacon of hope mm. and then I was going but that's not hopeful it's not a hopeful ending she's not a beacon of hope and um then I kind of felt sad that she <laughs> this this beautiful strong image of this girl um ended the book and then that that the whole poem really is about yeah she's only 10 you just you just wait you know she's got this she's got this whole whole thing ahead of her um yeah so it, it's such a sad it's such a sad poem for me in the end because it ends with Matilda. Um, so, yeah, I don't know. Powerful. I didn't answer very, your question. It's a but... very powerful ending, though, um, and a very and very salutary ending. I mean, like I, I finished and I went, you know. Mm. Um, and I like to think that I'm an aware person, but as a young man, I would have been completely oblivious to this, um, to this kind of experience. And I'm sure there are a lot of men, young and not so young, who still are probably. Um, so it's important, no matter how often it's done, it's important to still do it and to say these, to to do these poems. Um, I mean, the implication of this poem is that it's every woman's story. Yeah, 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 absolutely. And you know, we. we 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 do get angry when we talk about these things when we share these stories we all we, we share these stories you know they come up in conversation all the time oh yeah oh i remember when this happened you know um and we are angry but but we don't we don't get angry when we talk about it because we we've all experienced it in one way or another so it's that matter of factness again that you brought up yeah 
but that doesn't normalize it or does it well well it is it is normal i suppose um uh, you know i think i think that the greatest thing about the me too movement is that it is it does feel like a movement for men in many ways to 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 get the allies <laughs> yeah. you know um so i guess it is really important to normalize it you know, so, so, so does, does our husbands and our sons and our friends, they get that it's, it's actually, it's okay to walk on the other side of the street at night to not, not make the woman feel nervous or, you know, it's, 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 that's the right thing to do. And now I know this, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Has your daughter read this poem? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. She, she, she likes it. She likes it. Um, there's another poem with her in here, which is about, you know, when, when she has her first bleed and she's like, oh, mom. <laughs> Don't need that one. Yeah, right. Um, I mean, that, that sort of metaphor you've got there of her as a gymnast at the end sort of uh, leaves the reader hanging as well because uh, uh, she's hanging as a gymnast, but there is such trepidation in, in that hanging uh, mm -hmm. and, and in her maturation into, into a woman and, and what might come. Uh, and this is a question that um, you, I feel because I've got two daughters as well. Um, what do we say to our daughters about what they're likely to experience and how they might negotiate those experiences? Do you mean what do you as men say or what mm. do we as parents all say? Of us, all of us. What do we say? Um, it's interesting. So I'm sort of going through this question right now with um, – being menopausal <laughs> mm. and knowing that's something that you're not supposed to talk about, right? Mm. So knowing that when you're a child, you grow up thinking it's just when your period ends and thinking um, that women don't, women don't like going through it because it means they're losing their youth. Mm. When in fact, it means that like that is the least of our worries. <laughs> you're losing, I don't know any woman who cares about that, to be honest with you. And, um, you know, and the, the stopping of the period is a wonderful thing, you know, so really for us, menopause is about a lot of sort of harrowing body issues, yeah. you know, physical issues. And, um, and it's the same sort of thing where I'm just now going, well, I just feel like my, my purpose right now with the poetry I'm writing now, but also um, just in conversation is to just talk about it to yeah. men Mm. and to my children my my daughter and my children and my boys um mm. to normalize it to mm. just make sure that everybody knows that this is a part of life and why why in the world aren't we talking about it and it's quite a it's quite a big part of life you know mm. um and 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 why why is it taboo and it shouldn't be taboo so i suppose that in a roundabout way i'm saying that i think it's just important to always talk about these things mm. um you know, I don't know. I don't know that my husband would would feel the same as me about talking about all the scary things that happened in that poem with my daughter because that could scare her. Mm. Um, but I think you just choose the right time to to talk mm. about these things. You don't do it when they're six years old. Yeah. You know? yeah. All right. You've got one more poem for us from this book. Yeah, I do. Um, it's also a number poem, which I didn't even realize until, like I didn't even think about it, but. Um, all right, it's called The Weather. And it's in the section that's called Sick Ass Love. One, it's back, settling in like an old friend. So even though I'm angry and scared, I somehow want to embrace it. Does that make me a narcissist, a romantic? I say to illness, hey you, it's been a long time. Two, seven years. I'm softer now. I will sink into my bed more deeply. Dash will have to flip the mattress every couple of weeks. I will sink more readily. Illness replies. I've missed the boundaries of your body. Three, more and more my dog hides under our bed, afraid of the weather. It's either old age or climate change. He takes pills to counter one of them. Four, today I read the beginning of someone else's story. In quotes, the disease has been in remission for seven years. I see no point in lying to you. This is all true. 
A good story is a body with so many elements working together. I look out the window and the wind has stopped, but then it blows again, stronger. Five, the wind has severed limbs from trees, driven me mad for three days. It might be the cause of all this, sharp noise spinning me out, the barometric pressure, the world devouring itself in the buildup of its earth burp. Like when a hanger falls to the ground, my son hits a high note. When I flush the toilet, plastic crinkling, a door lock clicking, the sound of my own voice when I speak. Six, my acupuncturist needled me in bed today, showed me where to press the button of my feet to get um, the bottom of my feet to get rid of fear. Fear feeds illness. I'm frightened if I touch it too much and stop being afraid, I'll lose the desire to write. Fear feeds the writing. Seven, I am sheltered on a couch in my brick box office, surrounded by poetry and memoir, books about trauma, books about illness, four books on the top shelf about the Rolling Stones, which I'll begin to read as the band members die off one by one, or when my father does. Eight, I always think about my parents when it comes back. Illness reminds me I'm a daughter. Nine, Cicero says that a room without books is like a body without a soul. It's quiet out here away from the house and the people inside it who only want what's best for me. The wind's picked up again. There's a zombie cyclone over Queensland. New South Wales is flooded. I read about a dust storm there too. My illness has come back with a malice I haven't known for seven years. I need to be alone. 10, each time I cry today, I am supremely alone. 11, everything I write today is mine alone. 12, in America, my brother and his family are loved up snowed in. People there, used to snow, cannot believe the snow. They take selfies of themselves in it, smiling. Thousands have been left without power. Three people have died. 13. When the attack comes, it will be a violent storm. I am preparing for it. I am trying to prepare for it. It's annoying because I cannot prepare. New South Wales is still flooded. Um, I know it's it was well I felt that when I was reading it I thought oh my gosh <laughs> yeah um, yeah now you've you've written about um, chronic illness a, a lot over the years it's something that's um, important to you um, was there anything in particular that you wanted this poem to try and convey to readers about illness uh, look um, I mean I. I, you know, when I said I, I kind of turn to poetry when I need it, mm. um, it's, it's, it's just so true. And when I'm sick, I'm, I'm actually quite lucky when I'm sick in that I just can't move my head. Like I can't, I can't move a lot because it's a vertigo thing, which means I can read and I can write. Mm. So um, when I'm sick, I tend to write poetry. <laughs> it's just, um, it's the, it's the best thing to make me feel like I'm, um, um, I'm not losing myself in the illness. So, mm. um, I remember clearly writing that poem. I remember how I was feeling. I remember where I was sitting. I remember how long it took. I remember everything about that, about that poem because I was, I was so sick and it was just like, I was clinging to the writing to help me. So, you know, I, I write about illness a lot because, well, okay, I should say I write about illness a lot because I need it, mm -hmm. but I make sure I try to get it published <laughs> because I it's it's that normalizing thing again. I think it's really important to um, show that you know what one in every one in five people they reckon live with live with a a, a chronic illness. Um, that's a really big percent of the population. So it's just it's just so silly to think that. You know, I've, I gave in um, Rhymes with Hyenas, I gave Lilith MS. Mm. Um, I did that and I thought, oh, who should I give? Who should I give MS to? Which which person needs a, a storyline? And then I thought, well, actually, I'm going to give it to someone who already has a storyline because that's the thing about illness. It just doesn't choose who it goes to. It just goes to anybody. And so even though Lilith's storyline is that she's grieving um, the death of her, her wife, she's actually got this other storyline that's illness and that's because that's just what happened to her you know so it's a yeah it's again that normalizing normalizing thing and I guess I feel a little bit political when I get 
an illness poem published. <laughs> so it's important to me. Yeah. Um, now you said that uh, you had so kind of like you were almost surprised about the numbering uh, in this poem, <laughs> another numbering poem. But you know, when I see thirteen, when I see a poem in thirteen parts, uh, I always think of Wallace Stevens' poem Thirteen Ways of Looking at a a blackbird. <laughs> um, that poem wasn't in your mind when you wrote this one at all, was it? Not at all. I came to that poem so late in life, <laughs> <laughs> which I'm just really embarrassed to to admit. But um, maybe because I came to it so late in life, it's not in it. It, it doesn't come into my head. But I, I never have seen that connection. But you know, I suppose if I had, I would have titled it 13 Ways to Look at Illness," right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> or the weather. Thirteen ways to look at the weather. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's, uh, I mean, the weather the weather as a metaphor for illness. Um, is there a Rachel Mead? I think there's a Rachel Mead poem that talks about weather in 13 parts too. That, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I think we've had we've had that read on Poets Corner once before. Um, <laughs> so these two books are out now, and we've got uh, we've got details of these two books. I think going to be uh, with this podcast, so people can sort of check them out for themselves. Is there anything else you wanted to talk about about your theme today? Um, no, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's it, it, talking about theme like that was really um, kind of exciting when you said, can you come up with a theme? Because I think I am the kind of writer who loves to work with themes. So, uh, you know, like I'm really organized in my life. I like lists. I like, I like, I like to write things out and, you know, New Year's Eve is fantastic because I, I come up with these goals for the rest of the year. And so I'm the same way with writing. <laughs> you know, I'm just like, oh, okay, I'm working on a theme. I'm just going to write a million things to this theme. So, um, so it is, it is, it is fun. It is fun for me to, to think about, um, to think about, yeah, um, how two different books are similar in themes. Cause I've, I've never really thought, I've never thought about that with poetry so much, actually, because it just feels like each one is about what's going on in my life at that that specific time. And mm. also because Rhymes with Hyenas is a verse novel, it, it felt it felt strange to think of how that could connect with with um, a collection. Um, but clearly, clearly the themes that yeah they 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 made sense when I, when I put them together. But, well, yeah. when, when you, when you referred to the modern day tyrant, I didn't have to guess who it was <laughs> yeah. even before I read the book. Yeah. Uh, look, thank you so much, Heather, for sharing poems and insights on the theme of writing to and from historical figures, six literary heroines in one modern day tyrant. Um, I don't know if viewers will um, be motivated to read uh, those books that prompted those six literary heroines again or for the first time. I certainly <laughs> would like to get into them at some stage. Um, as mentioned, details of Heather's publications will be posted with this podcast, so look out for that. We will return in November with Peter Boyle on a theme to be advised. See you then. <laughs>